How does loose, soft sediment become hard, solid rock? The process of transforming soft sediment into sedimentary rock is called lithification. Some sediment undergoes lithification very quickly. It is lithified within weeks or even days of being deposited. You can find evidence of rapid lithification in limestones, evaporites, phosphorites, cherts, and volcanoclastic rocks, among other ones. A good rule of thumb is, if a rock consists of hydrogenous sediment, then it was probably being lithified as it was deposited. In other cases, it takes millions of years for sediment to become solid rock. Indeed, in many places in the world today, you can find unconsolidated sediment that is millions of years old and has never undergone lithification. Overall, lithification is part of a much bigger phenomenon called diagenesis. Diagenesis refers to all the physical and chemical changes that alter sediment after it is deposited. Diagenesis encompasses an array of processes, including lithification. Students sometimes confuse diagenesis with metamorphism, and with good reason. Like metamorphism, diagenesis is often caused by burial of rock and sediment and results from high temperatures and pressures that exist in our planet. In this context, Diagenesis is really just the first step of metamorphism. It would be most correct to say that there is a spectrum between diagenesis and metamorphism as they occur under different conditions. This graph illustrates the ranges of conditions with diagenesis and metamorphism. The vertical axis indicates burial depth how far down the sediment or sedimentary rock has been buried. The horizontal axis illustrates the temperature of the rock at that burial depth. As you can see, although diagenesis and metamorphism can occur at similar depths, diagenesis occurs at relatively lower temperatures, less than 250 degrees Celsius. That's why diagenesis doesn't create metamorphic rock. It's too cool. In any case, four things happen to sediment during diagenesis. Cements form between the loose grains and particles. At the same time, the particles undergo burial compaction and the sedimentary layers are compressed. Later, Minerals in the grains and cements sometimes are altered through processes like recrystallization, replacement, and thermal maturation. And along the way, various diagenetic chemicals and structures form, including concretions, natural gases, and petroleum. Lithification itself typically only involves compaction and cementation of sediment. These processes happen at the same time. At the beginning of diagenesis, sediment is typically soft, loosely packed, and filled with fluids like water and air. In terms of volume, mud can be up to 80% water. But things change with compaction. The compaction of sediment is caused by overburden pressure created by the deposition of sedimentary layers on top of it. The deeper sediment is buried, the greater the overburden pressure that develops and the stronger it feels the effects of compaction. A number of changes occur to the grains as they are compacted. First, the particles move around with respect to each other, and water is expelled from the rock. As a result, the spaces narrow between the clasts. 
the overall volume of the sediment decreases while its density increases. If the grains consist of minerals that aren't very hard, the grains themselves may undergo plastic deformation and become flattened along one axis. This isn't very common for hard mineral grains made of quartz and feldspar, but you can often observe it in micas and clays. They become flat. Another consequence of compaction is that some grains become fractured. We can see the consequences of burial compaction in various places. One important example is differential compaction, which happens when two types of sediment of different composition and density are deposited next to each other. The less dense sediment may lose more water and experience more plastic deformation so that it shrinks more in volume. If so, its sedimentary layers will appear to be more compressed around the other rock that it forms. We can also see the consequences of burial compaction when we prepare a sedimentary rock as a petrographic fin section and study it with a microscope. If we do this, not only can we observe evidence of plastic deformation and fracturing, but we can also observe the cements that formed between the mineral grains during lithification. The cements are simply minerals. Here, you can see cements composed of magnetite, an iron oxide mineral, which filled the spaces between the grains of feldspar and quartz. But there are many more common minerals that occur as cements in sedimentary rocks. Most cements consist of silica, calcium carbonate, and clay minerals, among others. These cements formed in the spaces between the grains, which we call the pore space. In sediment, the pore space is filled with water. During diagenesis, there are chemical reactions between the grains, the water, and the ions in the pore water, which cause the cements to form. In some cases, the formation of cement involves the dissolution of existing grains, releasing ions to the water, which can reprecipitate as cement. The reactions take place at low temperatures and are typically very slow. In the end, the pore spaces are largely, if not entirely filled by cement. The type of cement depends on a number of factors. These factors include the temperature of the sediment, the pH and acidity of the pore water, and the minerals that are present in the grains that can be dissolved into ions and that can reprecipitate as cement. In general, calcium carbonate cements precipitate at higher temperatures and higher pH levels than silica cements. Pore water dissolves calcium carbonate grains and cements if the acidity is too high. Importantly, cements also tend to form on grains of the same composition. Silica cements most commonly form on quartz grains. Carbonate cements are favored on ooids, peloids, bioclasts, and other grains made of calcite and aragonite. In fact, the minerals themselves precipitate on the clasts. The clasts provide nucleation sites for the formations of the crystals. Where a cement forms on a mineral of the same composition, we say that the cement is overgrowing the grain. Here, you can see a bioclast of an echinoderm called a crinoid. 
The boundary of the echinoderm grain is brown, and it is filled and surrounded by pink-green cement. The crinoid shell fragments in this sample consist of calcite, and those calcite shell fragments are surrounded by cements, which are also made of calcium carbonate in the form of calcite. Of course, overgrowth such as this is just one example of many different types of cement fabric. In this case, fabric refers to the arrangement of crystals in the cement, as well as their orientations with respect to the clasts. If the cement consists of very large crystals surrounding the grains, then we call it a poikilotopic cement. Alternatively, if each grain is surrounded by a rim of cement that is uniform in thickness, then we call it an isopacous cement. And if only certain areas of the grains are covered by a thin rim of cement, then we call it a meniscus cement. Minerals don't only form as cements during diagenesis. They also form through alteration of the sediment. Some minerals get replaced by new minerals as well. During replacement, one mineral is substituted for another. It is not unusual to find feldspar mineral grains in terrigenous rocks that have been replaced by clay minerals or bioclasts and carbonate rocks that have been replaced by silica. Calcite and aragonite are two minerals that are both made of calcium carbonate, but they have different crystal lattice structures. As a result, aragonite is considerably less stable than calcite under diagenetic conditions. So over geologic time, we often see that aragonite naturally becomes calcite. We call this recrystallization. When a crystal of one mineral gets replaced by something else, whether it be one or many crystals, we call it a pseudomorph if the new material has the same shape and form. Besides minerals, diagenesis is responsible for producing a variety of other things, including various structures and chemicals. Lazygong bands, for example, are millimeter scale bands of color that form in sedimentary rocks as a result of precipitation of iron oxide minerals during diagenesis. The bands themselves are easy to confuse with sedimentary laminae. However, if you look carefully, you will see that these bands cut across bedding planes and cross strata, and there are no textural differences between the bands. The different bands have the same sizes of grains. Stylolites are yet another problematic structure created during diagenesis. Stylolites are serrated surfaces. At first glance, they look like soft sediment deformation structures. However, they are actually produced by dissolution of minerals under the high pressures and temperatures that exist in our planet. But of all the diagenetic structures, Concretions and nodules may be the most common. These spheroidal and ellipsoidal structures form through the precipitation of minerals within soft sediment that is porous and permeable. Each concretion tends to consist of one mineral or material. They commonly consist of calcite, siderite, pyrite, apatite, or silica. Whatever the case may be, the mineral forms from a chemical reaction in sediment. This chemical reaction causes the minerals to grow around a central core or nucleus. 
often the nucleus of a concretion or nodule is the fossil of an organism which was buried in sediment and decomposed by microorganisms like bacteria. This decomposition altered the chemistry of the pore water and allowed mineral to form around the organism as a concretion or nodule. Consequently, it is not unusual to find concretions and nodules with fossils inside of them. Because the minerals often precipitated very rapidly, the fossils can be very well preserved and have exquisite detail. However, some concretions and nodules develop cracks during diagenesis as well. We refer to these cracks as septarian structures and to the concretions as septarian concretions. On the surface, septarian cracks resemble mud cracks. And while we aren't sure exactly why these cracks form, we know that they occur in concretions that do not consist of clay-sized particles, so they are obviously not desiccation structures. Be on the lookout for these confusing features of sedimentary rocks. Like many of the structures and minerals created during diagenesis, they are bound to give you some trouble. <laughs>